Um, my name is uh, Daniel Gulo, and I am the curator of the Malta Study Center at the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library. And uh, today it will be one of my great pleasures to introduce one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Matt Heinzelman, to uh, inform us about a curious period of Hill's history. Uh, before I do that introduction, however, there's a few matters of business that I would like to attend to. The first one, of course, is to remind everybody that this is the first of our three or perhaps four lectures that we will have this spring as part of the Hill Museum and Manuscripts Library lecture series. And I'm uh, very much looking forward to all of those. But the next one, of course, will take place on February 26th. And that will be Dr. Jochen Bergtor, uh, who will be presenting a research on the order of St. John of the Hospital and the papacy and the records uh, at, in the archives of Malta. That, will, again, will take place on February 26th at the normal time of 3 o'clock for our social, which I hope you were able to enjoy. And the lecture will begin at 4 o'clock till 5. Um, and also, before I introduce our speaker today, I'd like to thank Julie Dietman, Rachel Witt, uh, Linda Orshahowski, and Aaron Lonergan for their work in preparing the publicity and helping organize our events today. The staff at the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library does quite a bit in addition to their normal activities to make these happen. And of course, uh, I'm very appreciative, and so is uh, Himmel, to all of the staff at Alpine Library for continuing to allow us to use their facilities for these public lectures, so uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> so, as I mentioned earlier, I am very happy today to introduce my new colleague, and for you, a very old friend, uh, Dr. Matt Heinzelman, to discuss the history of the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library as Himmel slowly begins to inaugurate the year-long <coughs> celebration of its 50th anniversary of manuscript preservation here in Collegeville, Minnesota, and around the world. And as many of you already know, Dr. Heinzelman, for his, as many of you already know Dr. Heinzelman for his work at Himmel Alcuin Library and as an instructor at St. John's University, at least for me, I had the pleasure today of learning a little bit more about him and reminding me of the years of experience that have allowed Himmel to exist after 50 years of preservation work. Dr. Heinzelman actually began his career at the University of Notre Dame, his home state of Indiana, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly, where he graduated cum laude in modern languages and literature. He then traveled a few miles or a few hours west to my fair city, Chicago, where he finished his master's at the University of Chicago in Germanic Languages and Literature, which then still required people to write master's theses. Mm -hmm. And um, he did his work on the romance of Parzival. It's a very early study, an early student. Uh, Dr. Heinzelman <coughs> subsequently completed his doctorate at the University of Chicago, focusing on the work of the early, in early German drama in particular, the dramatic representation of the apocryphal acts of Pilate. After which, he continued his education at the University of Iowa, where he completed his MLS in Library and Information Sciences, specializing in the curation of rare books. Dr. Heinzelman came to Himmel in 2001, when he originally served as the Associate Director of the Library, and since 2004 has become, among many other things, the current curator of the Center for Austrian and German Medieval Studies, the curator of rare books and special collections, archivist of HMML. No, unofficially. Unofficially. <laughs> <laughs> and the reference and cataloging librarian of the institution of, of Hill. Uh, he is also the embodiment of the living record and local historian of the institution of of Hill, Muse of Hill Museum and Manuscript Library. And I'm very thankful that he will be uh, lecturing about that today. Dr. Heinzelman has published on several aspects of medieval German drama throughout his career, but most recently has dedicated his research to uncovering the early history of Himmel as an institution, including a 2012 article on Father Oliver Kastner, 
published in Theological Librarianship. Today, he will be addressing part of Himmel's early history that is very dear to my own heart and research, and one of the most important, if less known, well collections. Today's talk will focus on the 1970s microfilming project in Spain, whose title is very appropriate for those like myself who have had any experience working in Spanish archives. Today's talk will be entitled, A Very Difficult Time Getting Off the Ground Here, HMML's Path Through Spanish Libraries, 1973 to 1976. Welcome to the I should, I should add to that small introduction that one of the reasons I went to the University of Notre Dame is that I was actually a townie and lived two miles from campus. And I was able to save money by living at home and riding a bicycle to school every day. Otherwise, I never would have afforded a private school in, in those days. So that's the, my, my dad was a school teacher. So you can imagine what our, what our uh, income was like uh, even then. So um, this is going to be, I, I, I need to, I put my watch over here because I need to be reminded that we have to leave before 6. Because <laughs> I have difficulty with keeping track of time. And I have not read this out loud yet to know how long it will take. And as I get to the final pages, I will be switching over because this is definitely work in progress. And the last few pages that I'll be working with are from printouts of the letters that, I, um, that I'm working with right now. Um, so let me see if I can get this thing to work for me. There we go. So one of the things that, that I've come to in working on the history of Himmel over the last few months, and this is, as I say, it's been an ongoing thing. I've, I've looked at the history of Himmel for many years now. but. Um, it's really something that's picked up with our anniversary come, uh, this year, uh, is that we like to see ourselves in certain ways. And this is probably one of the ways we most love to see ourselves. This was published almost exactly 40 years ago in a newspaper in Saragossa, Spain, the Herardo Ar 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 Aragonés. Uh, and in there, if you know, you don't need to know a lot of Spanish to know that uh, the opening that's from Sunday, December the 8th, and that it's for the saving of ancient history or ancient culture. Uh, Benedict, American Benedictine Abbey is microfilming the manuscripts of the whole world. <laughs> the medieval manuscripts of the whole world. Now, you try to think how many medieval manuscripts are there in Central Africa? Well, OK. But you know, it, it goes on to say, you know, currently we've got three teams working in Spain, Malta, and uh, and uh, Ethiopia. So this is, this is how we picture ourselves. And here you have a nice picture, very fuzzy, but a nice picture of Urban Steiner, who's going to be the focus of my talk today. I never met Urban Steiner. He passed away in an accident in the 1980s. I don't know the exact date at the moment. I have to look that up. Long before I came, I came in 2001. So um, I have to reconstruct Urban in my own head as I work. Um, but this is, this is, as we read through the histories that, that have been written about Himmel through the years, they're almost always from this perspective, is what uh, we sometimes refer to as almost kind of a triumphalism. You know, what we did in Austria. And everything pales in, in comparison to what we did in Austria in the early years. And um, unfortunately, I think poor Urban suffered from a lot of that because he was the next generation. Uh, and I know from German literature, there's something called the, the Epigonen, the, the people who came afterwards. Those are the people who came after Goethe and after Schiller. And they were really fine authors, but they didn't measure up to Goethe and Schiller. And I think that's what happened, unfortunately, for, for Urban. Um, so. Urban came originally in 1971. Oh, by the way, I should also, um, I have to say this now because I know I'll forget at the end. But I want to thank several people or uh, different parts of the university. Himmel's history is records are splintered out in various places. Some are at the university archives. Some are in the Abbey archives. Much of it is in the Himmel archives. Um, and just today, 
Father Hillary very graciously gave me a couple pages talking about his visit with Urban in 1975, which lands dead center in the work that I'm talking about here. So this is, there's always more material there that, that has not yet been um, approached. So I want to thank all the various people, Peggy, David uh, uh, Klingeman, anyone who's brought stuff forward that I, I didn't have access to. And that first article came from the Abbey archives. That was the one thing David could find for me. And I said, yes, perfect. OK. So in, 19, in June 1971, Father Oliver Kapsner uh, welcomed his new colleague, his, his successor. Uh, Father Oliver had been there for, had been in Europe for seven years already, um, starting in 1964. So we're really already in the 50th anniversary period now. In fact, 50 years ago tomorrow, Oliver wrote a letter to, I think it was to Father Coleman, saying um, that the people from the microfilming company want him to hire women. And he said, no women, because they won't be allowed into the, man the male monasteries. So this kind of thing is, is going on constantly right now. We're reliving all those things 50 years ago. This, was, um, this is what happened uh, when, when, um, when Urban came to Vienna to, to meet up with Father Ol Oliver. Oliver reported back to Al Heckman, who was our uh, connection with the Hill Family Foundation, which is where we get the Hill Library name. Uh, he, and he reports back saying, uh, Father Urban Steiner from St. John's arrived here last week, and eager beaver that he is, is studying and practicing the various tasks and responsibilities to be performed in our project. Well, that sounds beautiful. You know, gung ho, he's about 40 years old, 39 years old, so he's ready to go. But only four and a half years later, this same, the, the, his, this successor, that is Urban, wrote the following. Uh, after discussing the ongoing problems he was facing with a lack of work and exorbitant customs duties, he, he wrote the following to Himmel's director, to Julian Plant. Uh, January 16th, 1976, 39 years ago. Quote, finally, under the circumstances, I personally would like to be relieved of my duties. If you think it feasible, I, would, I could continue until the fall. Little gap here. I feel that I have done my very best in exhausting the possibilities, and now I have frankly reached the threshold of my endurance of frustration. Should you feel that the unexplored horizon still warrant further effort and more labor, I will be quite willing to use the intervening months to train a successor of your choice. So he's 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 already gone from Spain, and this is this is six months before he even leaves. So in talking about the 50th anniversary, as, as Daniel has already pointed out, um, we are looking at the various aspects of what was done over the, the past 50 years. The first 40 of which were largely done with microfilm. The last decade has almost been entirely digital. Well, actually has been entirely digital. Um, but that at every stage of the way, we were looking for new places, new areas to work, new things to bring into the collections. Um, so it was 50 years ago, at this very time, that Father Oliver was preparing for his first microfilm work in Austria. He had procured agreements with 16 monasteries and abbeys and was working with university microfilms to put the technology of piece of the puzzle into place. Himmel often dates its start to the start of microfilming in Kremsminster, Austria in April 1965. As one might expect, the actual start of filming required many months of planning, making contacts, public relations, and yes, disappointments. That Oliver was able to persevere and ultimately lead the work in Austria to great success is a sign of a great idea landing in the right spot at the right time. Himmel had been, and I, I won't elaborate on that now, but I'm, that's one of the things I'm working on in the Austria piece of the puzzle. Um, if I do that, we won't get to urban, and that would be unfortunate. Again, lost in the shadow. Um, Himmel has been justly proud of the work done there, and sometimes it seems as though Father Oliver has been raised to the status of a, quote, librarian saint, um, which I have to admit I share some guilt in, in uh, spreading. Um, 
So but su such bibliophilic hagiography aside, we can see from this list that Himmel's work continued on through the years with each passing decade bringing new sites and new challenges for the microfilming project. Building on Benedictine values of trust, respect, and listening, Himmel has always striven to work with other libraries and their communities, not to dominate them. Indeed, even the name by which we are known, the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library, has only been with us for a little over a decade. From the earliest proposals for this project, the exact nature of Himmel's personality took many years to develop. The name itself, Hill, only came into being in the mid-1970s, a decade after work started. I have to be careful that I don't mix up my sets of pages here. Um, a 1964 prospectus for the soon-to-be-built Alcuin Library refers to this simply as the Monastic Microfilm Project. In the following presentation, I will use somewhat anachronistically the acronym HIMMEL to refer to the library and its work, unless the earlier name appears in a quotation that I'll be reading. And I will say that a great deal of what I'll be read giving to you today is actually uh, so to speak, cribbed, because a lot of what I'll be giving you uh, is direct reading from Oliver Caps, and I'm sorry, <laughs> doing it again, Urban Steiner's letters, uh, as well as some of his colleagues. Because I think the person, being the person who has gone through this, Urban would be the one who, who has the most evidence to, to share with us. Interest in work in Spain appears already in some of the earliest conceptualizations for the microfilming project. But active engagement with plans for Spain only starts around 1968 to 1971, at least according to our correspondence files. Here we find letters between Al Heckman, our connection to the Hill uh, Foundation, uh, Barry Coleman, Oliver Kapsner, Julian Plant, Cortland Hill from the Hill family, and others. These letters point to an eagerness to initiate a project outside of Austria, in particular in Spain. Already at this time, there are problems fostering interest among Spanish libraries, a challenge that never goes away, as well as the difficulty of pinpointing where the major collections are even located. The difficulties with gaining access to collections prompt some to suggest working with intermediaries, like including the Duchess of Alba, and one writer who even suggests that it would be possible through connections to get a request in front of Francisco Franco himself. To my knowledge, such a request was never made to El Caudillo. I think we're probably today grateful for that, even if it meant our work didn't quite succeed. Uh, but his oppressive rule was likely a backdrop, if not a contributor, to some, many of the difficulties later faced by Father Urban. OK, let's see. So Urban's primary responsibility in the start was to finish the work in Austria and to move the materials on to Spain and to move the team on to Spain. Um, already while well, he was, he finished work in Austria in the summer of 1973. So already in 1972, he took a trip to Spain to meet with some of the librarians to try to, to uh, get some interest going. And so he reports back in May of 1972 uh, to Julian Plant, the director of the library, I couldn't term my trip to Spain as a phenomenal success, but I would say that it was certainly eminently worthwhile. To date, I have commitments from seven libraries, Montserrat, Silos, the Catholic Library of Barcelona, I'm sorry, Cathedral Library of Barcelona, Cathedral Library of Vich, um, Tortosa, Tarragona, and Saragossa. These have an average of about 300 manuscripts each, so work for about a year. There are, were some outright negative replies, but for the most part, the other church libraries that I visited were hesitant, dubious, or skeptical. I have made some good public relations contacts. The archivist at the Cathedral Library of Barcelona is a Roman classmate of our father, Jude Cole. Now, if anyone's read my blog in the last few years, which you probably haven't, Father Jude Cole left unbelievable amounts of stuff, and that's the polite word for it, in the rare book room that we're still trying to figure out what it all is. So his name comes up. Seeing his name was, was actually sort of like 
opening the window and having a, a, a nice January breeze come in. Um, the archivist at the, at the Cathedral Library of Barcelona, oh, sorry, I read that. He is undoubtedly the most enthusiastic of all, um, this, uh, the archivist in Barcelona. He is the vice president of the National Association of Ecclesiastical Archivists. I'm presently, I'm presenting a formal application to the president of that association, and hopefully it will come up for discussion in their next month's meeting. Canon Fab, it should be uh, Fabegra, uh, Grau, he's got the, the name wrong here, uh, gave me, uh, the, the archivist in Barcelona, gave me to understand that as vice president of the association, he would be our spokesman and he is hoping to get all the archivists of the church libraries to accept our project on block. Wow, wouldn't that be great? Just to have that mandate to, to move across. Well, despite his hopes for success with religious libraries, Father Urban faced uh, strong opposition from the state libraries. And in later estimates that we did after the project, the, uh, they came up with a rough figure that probably about 90% of the manuscripts were actually in state libraries. Only a very small percentage were still in the religious houses. So here he says, I also had a long and I think profitable talk with the director of national libraries, Mr. Luis Sanchez Belda of Madrid. He didn't say no. For academic reasons, he said he would agree forthwith. But what causes him problems are political reasons. He spoke in terms of a brain drain from Europe. He said, America has the best opportunities for scholars all the way around, financial, physical, etc. The only thing they don't have are the historical documents. Now, he reasons, if they, that is the Americans, get them, there will, be, there will no longer be any reason at all for a scholar to live and work in Europe. This is a part of what's going to be a continuing theme through here is what we see is different perceptions, different understandings of what we are about. Our goal, we see ourselves as being a Benedictine institution following Benedictine teaching and thought and trying to be uh, non-hegemonic and as soon as we go overseas we are an American institution and it's something that we've struggled with in many places in Spain that was definitely one of the biggest difficulties that we had okay so he eventually does make it to Spain in the summer of 1973 Already during his work in Austria, where Father Urban directed the microfilming in several libraries in Graz, Innsbruck, and elsewhere, he was feeding clues to the director of HMML, or Himmel, that perhaps he did not want to be the field director in Spain. As early as 1972, he is suggesting to Julian Plant that someone else, and there's a, a name involved here, that they, a person they discussed, that that someone else should take over the project. This idea was quickly and thoroughly quashed by Julian Plant. Father Urban even sent a brief job description, about three paragraphs long. It's amazing, you know, you could describe what he was doing in that amount of space. Uh, that's impossible. Uh, so a description for the field director at the request of the university president, Father, Father Michael Blecker. So the, the hope was, I think, that they were trying to standardize, and maybe keep an eye out. Maybe one of the other monks could go instead, uh, although the person in discussion here was not from the abbey. In the meantime, Urban continued to find new places to film in Austria, so that his move to Spain had kept being delayed. And when it finally did come, he writes uh, in July of, of 1973 to, to Julian Plant, you may be surprised to be hearing from me out of Austria at this late date. Ever since we resumed operations, we've been trying to arrange for the transit of our equipment out of Austria and into Spain. After visiting several customs agencies, export firms, the AAA, Spanish Consulate, Department of Commerce in four different cities, I could only conclude that these people are really confused and none of them know exactly what is going on. Each has requirements and makes statements in direct contradiction to the other. Finally, we ended up having to make certain adaptations on our van, an irremovable wall between the front seat and the load, grids over the windows, pins on the hinges, spot welded into place. 
Then we had to drive to Innsbruck to have the car inspected and obtain certifying documentation. This had to be, this had to be done and could only be done in Innsbruck because that's where the vehicle was registered. This sounds sort of like the beginning of Luke, right? You know, Luke's gospel, they had to go back to where the, well, anyway. Um, Today we are um, continuing with, uh, with Urban's letter. Today we are loading so that we will be able to present the load to the local customs officials for inspection. After they certify to the contents, the doors will be sealed with lead seals. Throughout transit, the seals may not be broken, but with the accompanying documentation, we can purportedly drive through the Austrian, Swiss, and French borders without prolonged questioning or customs deposits. This sounds like a heck of a lot of work just to get a microfilm camera to another country, but that's, that's the way it was in the 1970s. What will happen at the Spanish border where the equipment will remain for a time is anyone's guess. I presume the seals will be broken and we will have to pay the usual customs fees. Okay, so setting up in Spain. Urban reports lots of problems he, uh, from uh, from August 1973, he, he writes, has Father Oliver returned from Malta yet? Oliver Kapsner was pressed into service and starting three projects at the same time meant that you had humongous problems in Ethiopia, humongous problems in Malta, and humongous problems in Spain. Which one are you gonna fix? And can you fix all of them? So he asks about Father Oliver. How are things going in the project there? Bob Asselson told me that their man from the, their, tells me that their man from the London office who was training the technicians to work in Malta is about to leave. This point was made because we have been having, the title, a very difficult time getting off the ground here in Spain. The day after you left, both Paul and Hans, his two Austrian cameramen, both Paul and Hans quit and returned to Austria. He's only been there a month, <laughs> okay? Um, beyond this, Father Urban complains about the lack of logistical support from University Microfilms, who was supposed to provide the technical and logistic, were the technical and logistical experts for the project, and from, Co from Kodak, from whom he had purchased a microfilm reader that, quote, burned out forthwith because it was not of the proper voltage, although we were assured <laughs> it was. Okay. So here we are at Montserrat. Um, Let's see, did I? I think I skipped that screen. That was supposed to be the screen, that's okay. Did you see that one? Yeah. Okay, that's, as you see, that's Montserrat, taken actually a couple years after he worked there because that's when I was a student. So I actually went to Montserrat as a student by myself. It was fun, so to speak. Okay, so Father Urban explains that uh, in Montserrat, he explains that one employee claimed that he would return to work on the project, one of the Austrians, but he kept delaying that return until Father Urban could wait no longer, and finally they had to let him go. Urban also suspected the other cameraman of sabotage when an entire load of film was rejected by University Microfilms, and Urban then found out that the camera was set incorrectly. But then, quote, this type of behavior is also quite consistent with some of the other pranks that Hans pulled in his last days here. In all, he photographed one manuscript, which turned out beautifully, but he was labeling unused film as containing certain manuscripts and sending in the unused film to be developed. On, one re on the one reel that contained his good manuscript, the label on the box said there were two more manuscripts on the reel, but actually there were only seven pages of a 250-page manuscript and the rest of the reel was just cranked through the camera. On the other hand, as Father Urban reports to his brothers at St. John's Abbey, his treatment by the monastic community in Montserrat has been exemplary. Quote, I've been here for about three months and never ceased to be impressed by the place. At every turn, one can't help but realize that this is, a tr is truly a well-ordered house. In spite of the thousands of pilgrims and tourists, like me, that come to the monastery daily, the monastic order of prayer and silence is not disrupted. The monks have delegated most of their enterprises to laymen who are apparently doing a very good job in administering, administering the various operations. It seems that whenever they, whatever they undertake, be it the production of liquor or the sale of ceramics, they do it with thoroughness and professional expertise. 
so they can't help but succeed. So the, what he's telling his fellow monks at St. John's and what he's telling Julian Plant are kind of going off in two different directions. So we're already seeing the mixed messages about the work in Spain. The public face and the face shown to the monastic community uh, is very happy and upbeat. At the same time, there's nothing but a, a, a litany of problems reported to Julian Plant. So he moves on. After finishing in Montserrat, he moves on to Barcelona. And in Barcelona, he actually is the place where his biggest supporter is located, the one person in Spain who's trying his most to help him, Dr. Uh, Fabrica y Grau, Ángel Fabrica y Grau, uh, who was the archivist there, uh, and his associate, Josep Balsels y Reg, um, who um, actually are still around. Uh, today, the archivist at the, at the uh, chapter archive in, in uh, Barcelona is uh, Josef Balsels, and the archivist emeritus is Ángel uh, Fabrica. So it's amazing, after 40 years, they're still, still active in the same place. Um, but at the same time, there are questions of legality to the project. Are they even allowed to do this? And uh, uh, Ángel Fabrica helps work to, with a lawyer to try to get things into a contract so that it sounds safe. Um, and uh, Urban reports back, I'm happy to report at this time that our work is moving along at a good pace. And Fred Berich, the representative from University of Microfilms, has said that the quality of our films is very good. We have almost finished a collection of slightly more than 200 codices here at the Cathedral Archives. After Christmas, we will move on to Tarragona. After, the, after my visit there last Tuesday, I was somewhat disillusioned to learn they have little. But if we get into Tortosa after that, then we can let our anchor down for a while. So it would be a really good, large collection. And then the moment to make all St. John's students proud, I'm sure, all the alums. At this time, I would like to communicate a rather unusual request, which I hope you can classify under the category of public relations. The two priest archivists of the cathedral, out of the clear blue sky, told me they wanted each a sweatshirt from St. John's University. <laughs> Angel Fabrica Grau, large, and Josep Balsels, medium. And it should be sent to the archive in, at the cathedral in Barcelona. So uh, this actually became sort of a mini home, in a way, for urban because he goes back to the archive, the diocesan archive. He goes back to, to, to spend time with the people at the, at the chapter archive over and over because that seems to be the, that's, that's where he's most welcome. Uh, he has rough moments with the diocesan archive because they don't get their microfilms in time, but eventually they get their microfilms and then they're happy again. And this will become a theme that comes in as we move forward as well. Um, the problem was that the agreement was that when we made microfilms of their manuscripts, we took one copy and used it here, one copy went to storage in Michigan, and one copy went to the monastery or library in Spain. But you have to realize that the copies were made here and shipped back. And so what does the Spanish government want to do? Charge customs fees. And if they charge customs fees, then those libraries are saying, well, we don't have the money for these films. You said we would get them for free. Ah, so this became a long, long drawn out uh, problem throughout, throughout the work. So then we, he moved on, finished in 1973 in Barcelona, continued some work in Barcelona, and then marched through all these libraries in the course of 1974. Um, and I will go through these very briefly because basically what I'm giving you is kind of a narrative of where he was and what he was doing. Uh, oh, and that was the cathedral in Barcelona. That's the one Wikipedia page I used. Okay, that's, a, that's the one time I cheated. Everything else is from our files or, or my files. Um, so the first two places he went after Barcelona were the, the abbeys of Poblet and Valbona, Valbona de las Moncas. Um, and he, re he, respond he reports back uh, in March of 1974, I froze for a week at Poblet, because it was in the middle of winter, and 
They usually don't have heat in the buildings in Spain because it doesn't get as cold as it does in Northern Europe. So I froze for a week at Poblet and then left the ice box for the deep freeze when I went to Valbona de las Monjas. De las Monjas. Both collections have been filmed. Although they are small, I think they are both valuable additions to our liturgical collections. At the end of the Valbona manuscripts, I filmed about nine or ten very rare editions of the Rule of Benedict, even though these are printed editions. So he's trying to make do, he's trying to fill in gaps when he doesn't have enough material uh, right up front to use. So then he continues on to Tortosa. And then, oops, okay, that's, I had to give a couple examples of what he was looking at in Poblet and Valbona. In Tortosa, in the same letter from before he continues, we are now at Tortosa, which is by far the finest manuscript collection that we have done here in Spain, also the largest. Have been here almost three weeks and doubt if we can finish before Easter, as there will be quite a lot of color work, color microfilming, to do when we finished black and white. Still haven't been able to find a second cameraman, so I'm getting round-shouldered trying to do double duty. Um, and then this was this. I have to share this with our, our photographer colleague. Uh, the again the the suggestion was made that there was someone who could be his assistant who could help with the mic with the microfilming, and he wants this person actually to take his place. But Julian Plant says no, uh, and so he says, well, he should really he should describe the difficulty of the work for the camera people. So I think it would be good if I would describe for you what is entailed in this position, that is, as camera operator. There is really nothing glamorous about it at all. On the contrary, it is filled with monotony and routine, and actually isn't even very challenging intellectually. I've got to share that with Wayne. Um, working hours right now are from 9 AM until 8 PM, with two hours off for lunch and siesta. The work, as you know, is in a dark room. Often workspace is cramped, and the room is usually poorly ventilated. There can be very little talking during work, as one must count pages so as not to skip. There's also a daily work quota which we must strive for, 2,000 exposures. So you try to, uh, I'm not even going to try the math on that one right now. But you, that's, a, that's a lot in the course of an hour per hour. Um, Moving as frequently as we do also poses problems. The equipment must be dismantled, loaded, unloaded, and then reassembled. The transformers weigh, as, weigh at least 150 pounds each, just to run the, the microfilm equipment. Compared to what we do today in the Middle East, in North Africa, and, and the Ukraine, places we work, where you can have a laptop and you can have a camera that you can carry on your side and have virtually a whole studio right there. Uh, it's amazing that they could even get this work done. Um, often these things have to be carried up several flights of stairs, which can be very narrow and sometimes even winding. So as I said, this was, this was an attempt, again, to get someone to take his place, at, but not to be his assistant. And there's at least one more instance of this coming up with another. So this was with, um, with uh, Jose Luis Gutierrez from the Abbey. And then the second one was with Brother Paul Fitz. So they kept trying to get people who could come and be his assistant. And he said, I don't need an assistant. I need someone to take my place. <laughs> <clears throat> he went, moved on to work in Gerona. Gerona was one of the more successful locations for him. Uh, the, his report back to the Abbey is, work, in, work here in Spain seems to have gotten off the ground. Uh, he, loved that, he loved that analogy. Uh, it seems that almost each day brings its own particular problems in one form or another, but somehow, through the grace of God, we manage to keep going. I am particularly grateful that we are being well received and that there seems to be enough work. Uh, let's see. However, within the same time period, from Gerona, he's writing, in the same, a week later, he's writing to Julian Plant, while I find my work very hard and at times frustrating, I am quite contented to stay on at it if the abbot and others feel that I can serve the community best in this position. As soon as I am needed more somewhere else, I'll be ready to move. <laughs> That's not very subtle. <laughs> and I'm sure that Julian Plant was not exactly uh, pleased with the, with the tone. So here, uh, one of the more famous manuscripts from Gerona. 
uh, filmed in color, one of the uh, commentaries on the apocalypse by Beatus. Um, I just had to put this in for eye candy because, well, this is, this is one of the reasons that people like to do manuscript studies, right? So then he moves on to Veitch. And, uh, and this is supposed to be Augustine, by the way. That's uh, from, a, from a rule of Augustine. Um, and here he reports, he reports to Julian on the difficulties of working in Spain in terms of time and time allowance. This, uh, quote, this is the anniversary date of our arrival in Spain and the beginning of the monastic manuscript microfilm project in this country. We might therefore be in a good position to make some observations concerning the past and our future. So this is July 18, 1974, a year after he started. In the past year, we have filmed about 1,250 manuscripts. I know this is down considerably from the production of previous years, that is, in Austria. Uh, the reasons are well known. Even if the difficulties of staff and mechanics had not existed, I'm sure there would have been a reduced output nonetheless. We have often been limited in our working hours, so it is sometimes difficult to arrive at a 40-hour work week. Then, too, Spain has many more holidays than Austria used to have. Today being the anniversary of the end of the Spanish Civil War, we were unable to work. Next Thursday, the Feast of St. James, everything will be closed again, and so on. Veitch was later to come back to haunt uh, Urban, especially because it was in Veitch and uh, one of the other libraries that spe specifically uh, became very outraged and outspoken critics of the project because they couldn't get their manuscripts without paying the customs fees. And this is one of those things where it was a very sensitive issue because many of these places didn't have much money. And he says elsewhere in his correspondence, many of these archivists were only there part time. They, that's one of the reasons they weren't open very long. These were not considered really professional positions, unlike, say, places in Central Europe where it might have been a, a better paid and more respected position. So they often had to have second jobs. Uh, in Seo de Urgel, he moved on and he was able to photograph another Beatus manuscript. And he reports on a trip to, to uh, try to find more work. He says the August shutdown. This past weekend, beginning on Thursday, beginning on Thursday, I went to Barcelona to arrange more work. But I couldn't have been more frustrated. The month of August is sheer paralysis for Spaniards as everything closes down for vacation. Not a library or archive in the city is open. And one is even hard put to find a dentist, I learned. So that kind of gives you an idea of things, the direction of the, of, uh, the difficulty of the work. Um, however, it was balanced at times with moments of kindness. In Huesca, uh, Huesca I should say, uh, where this manuscript is, was photographed, uh, the librarian actually went out of his way to help uh, Urban. Uh, so we left Seo de Urgel last Friday and arrived here, that is Huesca, Friday afternoon. For a while I thought that the same thing was going to happen as happened at Lerida, where for the archivist said that the normal archive horarium hours was about two or three hours a day. Imagine trying to get much work done in two or three hours a day, microfilming dozens of man manuscripts. I suggested that he hire a man of confidence to watch over us in his absence and that we would pay the salary. In any case, the archivist is a gentleman, and he was willing to search out some way in which to accommodate us. When I met him again on Saturday, he suggested that we work in the sacristy of the cathedral and move the manuscripts that we need each day from the archives. This will not only enable us to work a normal day, but also eliminated the need for us to carry our heavy equipment up the long, narrow stairway leading to the archives. Yesterday afternoon, we unloaded and set up our equipment in almost record time. If we can make the necessary electrical hookups now, we should be ready to roll tomorrow morning. Of course, that's a big if, because different places had different voltages and different, uh, different systems, so what worked in one place may not work somewhere else. Once in a great while, and this is one of them, uh, a little bit of, so to speak, real reality creeps into his letters from outside. And so he writes here, this is in, I'll get the date here, this is in October 1974. Quote, the political situation here seems very tense as people await the death of Franco. No one knows what will happen then. 
but it is estimated that more than 75% of the population want a new form of government. I wonder how long they will wait for it. During the Generalissimo's recent illness, the army was called out on alert, and the streets and highways continued to team with police in Guardia Civil. When Portugal had their coup, some of the locals seemed green with envy. So this is a very different world from the Austrian world that Oliver Kapsner worked in. And I'm realizing I'm very late on time, so I'm going to get through the next little bit, and then I'll probably leave off a lot at the end. I'll show you the pictures so you can see the pretty pictures. But I'm going to leave um, at a, a couple incidents that happened midway through his time in Spain, just to give you an idea of the difficulty he faced. Um, in Saragossa, it was largely a successful stop. And in fact, it's one of the few places where we actually have a photograph of Urban Steiner in Spain. One of the things you wish they would have done is they would have bought a cheap Instamatic and given the monks Instamatics, because we have very few pictures of the monks actually working overseas. We have very little visual documentation of what they did except the microfilm, which of course is misleading. It's only one side of the story. And so it's wonderful. This picture was actually taken by Julian Plant when he visited um, Urban Steiner in 1974. Uh, so that was, that's, we're fortunate to have that. It's also the first picture that I know of where he's actually, you can't tell in this because of the, of the projector, he's actually sporting, sporting a beard. If you remember that picture at the beginning of the presentation, he's very clean-faced, almost baby-faced. And here he's got a very, very, very manly beard there. Um, so uh, it's during this period, though, that he starts, um, he has two of the most difficult moments in his career there. First off, not feeling welcome. He reports to Julian that while he was, in, he visited Madrid, and while in Madrid, I followed your suggestion to see the ambassador, the, the American ambassador. Unfortunately, he was tied up into the next week, so I had to settle for an employee of the embassy. These are Spanish nationals, and while they try to be helpful, they are not very friendly or sympathetic. Remember, this is all Urban's, you know, this is, this is his characterization of the people he's meeting. Every time I open the can of worms relating to our legality here in Spain, I get a sinking feeling in my stomach, weak in the knees, and courage goes out from me. The lady I was talking to said that we need the permission of the Ministry of Education to do any microfilming in Spain, and that all films must be handed over to the Ministry of Education or the Department of Justice before they can be exported. To quote her directly, I will tell you one thing. If the Spanish customs authorities find any of your films leaving the country, you will be arrested. Now, there is a cheery encouragement to go into work, right? It's like, well, if I do my job right, I could be arrested. If I don't do my job right, then we won't have anything to show for it at the end. Well, it's almost at that exact same time that I think what happens is probably the worst moment in the entire history of the field work that we've done in uh, the microfilming at, at Himmel. Now, it's very possible that there are uh, incidents I'm not aware of from Ethiopia or Malta, but this is certainly the one that made the most uh, impact when I read it. Um, he writes about the same time that he's writing, I think the same letter that he's writing about the threat of being arrested. He writes, right now I have the Biblioteca Central in Barcelona, he means the Biblioteca de Catalunya, in Barcelona on the string. They have a big collection. I have a, the staff convinced of the merits of the project, but the head of the manuscripts department has asked me to that I present myself for a personal interview. He did that, and people were supportive. Sounded very good. However, he reports on December 7th of 1974, so almost exactly 50, uh, 40 years ago, my joy at having landed the sizable collection of the Biblioteca de Catalunya here in Barcelona was very short-lived. My considered judgment is that I fell victim to some of the bitter infighting within the library. My first encounter was with a member of the staff who directed me to the office of the directress. I presented my card to the secretary who returned 
to say that since the matter dealt with manuscripts, I should consult the head of the manuscripts department. He was out, but I called on the subdirector, who was very congenial and had highest praise for our project. At a later date, I met the department head again, so the manuscripts person, uh, again in the presence of the subdirector. He told me he needed some time to study the terms of the contract and discuss them with the other members of the administration. We set a date for when I would return for the final verdict. Which, um, when I returned, the department head again with the subdirector and company. So these are you know, like the upper echelon, but not the director. Everyone up close, though, um, said that everything was in order and that I need only give a few days' notice before my arrival, which I did. When we arrived, the subdirectory, subdirector kindly received us and facilitated our setting up to our cameras. He even put the house electrician at our disposal to make the necessary and difficult electrical hookups. About that time, the directress came along. At first, she was quite laudatory of everything, but finally I noticed she was outraged. She told me that she had never been apprised of anything that was going on here and that the department head was not in authority to give such permission. There was further delay and behind the scenes seething, but then yesterday afternoon she came and said that there is, absolutely, there is to be absolutely no filming. I was made out to be a transgressor and virtually threatened with arrest. And he describes it later in another letter as being basically, they, they forced him to carry everything out again. Now, Consider how we see ourselves and consider an instance like this. We have to think a little more critically about how others see us when we come into their space to do that work. And Urban, try as hard as he did, didn't have it in writing and made the mistake of not talking to everybody in power. And he might have just gotten a no, had he. But as it was, that was like the most humiliating thing that has happened that I'm aware of in all of the work that we've done overseas. And at that point, I think Urban starts to become less and less involved even more than, I mean, he's even less involved in what he's doing than he was before. Um, let me finish off. That's the first year and a half of our time in Spain. I know that I'm running over time, so I'm going to move ahead here. We continued on and, and we did work in Spain in 1975. A great deal of the work was at um, the library at the, the uh, Biblioteca del Cabildo in Toledo. There, again, the opposition, uh, the politics is amazing. If you read through the correspondence, uh, the Cardinal of Toledo said yes, and he put the pressure on the canonry who said no, and the librarian who said no, and ultimately the Cardinal won out, but then it was the librarian who decided what Urban got to work with, and so Urban didn't always get the things that he thought were there that he should work with. It's, it's amazing just how complicated it, it could be. Um, whoops, jumped, there we go. Uh, and it's at this library where Urban is actually escorted out at the end of the project in January of 1976, he finishes in, in Toledo. And they come out and inspect the vehicle to make sure he doesn't have anything from the library in the vehicle before they leave. I mean, this is impossible. This is, this is not the, 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 the history that we know from Austria and from Oliver Kapsner. Um, he continues on finishing up projects that have already been uh, put into, uh, into the hopper, so to speak, in 1976. Uh, but again, he's just biding his time trying to get out the door. Um, and many of these are, are you know, beautiful manuscripts, beautiful places. Some of them are only in black and white. At that point, it was just not worth trying to, to put too much effort into it. And Pamplona was the last big place that he worked in 76. And we went, he went back in the summer of 77 to finish one last library in Madrid, which I didn't include here. Um, so Urban came back, now sporting a, a very fine beard. I'm very envious. My wife would never let me have a mustache like that, I can tell you right up front. Um, 
But uh, it, it, his final, one of his last letters from, from Spain in 1976, it says, today's mail also contained a letter from the abbot, the contents of which disclosed that I am to take over the associate pastorate of Albany, that is Albany, Minnesota. Um, the date for the transfer was indicated as by July. I have written to the abbot and told him that I had been calculating with the end of September or the beginning of October. I don't think I will be able to finish all there is to do here by July. Therefore, there seem to be the following possibilities. One, we get an extension from the abbot. Two, that you send someone immediately who could take over. Or three, you set up priorities so we know what to finish by July and leave the rest for another time. But Urban had finally had enough. And that letter that I showed you at the beginning where he resigned, he offered his resignation in January of 76, was a clear sign that he had put up with a lot. And he had accomplished a lot. But at every, there was never a chance where he felt like things were really humming along, that he was always facing another, another problem um, that was going to, to keep us from, from fulfillment. And if you remember that newspaper that I showed you at the beginning with the, with the microfilming the manuscripts, medieval manuscripts of the whole world, that appeared in the paper the day after he was kicked out of the library in Barcelona. Okay, so it's, if you talk about conflicted feelings, you know, I mean, how do you, how do you bring those two together? So, I won't bother reading those off the screen. I think you get a sense. I think the biggest thing is we have to learn to realize how others see us, the people that we work with. But also we have to have people who are really invested in what we do. Father Oliver was very invested. Today, Father Columba is very invested. Many of the other field directors were very invested, very interested in what they were doing. But it's very difficult to have someone work that far away and not feel that they're doing what they were called to do. And I think Urban did not feel that he was called to be in Spain. Um, and the other thing is that we need to continue to analyze. I feel that this is just the beginning. This is the very start of a process of analyzing our history, not just retelling the history, but actually thinking about what we did right and what we did wrong. And I think there's a lot of material here for what we did wrong. Thank you. Well, I certainly want to thank uh, Matt Doctor and Dr. Heinzelman for a very illuminating lecture. I, uh, for myself, having worked with these manuscripts on microfilm for two years when I was a graduate student at the School of Theology, and then again when I was doing my doctoral research in 2004, this is actually really quite illuminating to me to hear for the very first time some of the internal uh, problems that were discovered in Spain. And in the looking at them, recognizing that in many respects, these are the same problems we have in Europe today. And we've even had recent conversations about this kind of continuing need, as, as Dr. Heinzelman has pointed out, of this ongoing self-evaluation and how we can best serve our, our, our clients in, this, in, a, in a way, or our, work, our partners is probably a better term, to bring about these processes, particularly because in Europe, 90% uh, of the stuff is in state archives, and that creates a significant amount of state archives and state libraries, um, a, a, unique, a unique problem um, as we address this in the coming century. So I want to thank this is actually helping me out with my own current work in Malta. I so I'm very happy I should, about this. I should, I should interject quickly, too, that they did photograph 6,200 manuscripts yeah. in Spain. Much of it was archival material, but also general manuscripts, law, history, music, Bibles, whatever. Um, so it was really, they did do a lot in those three and a half years, but it was a struggle the whole way. We should take some questions from, from anybody who might have them. I have one in particular, but I'd like to open them up. Yes, Wilfred. Does it hill still have our, our camera in Portugal that we left there? Last I knew, I think we said, please get rid of it. But yes, I know when I started here in 2001, I received messages from someone in Lisbon who was storing a microfilm cabinet or microfilm uh, camera in her house uh, because we left Portugal in a hurry as well. I think they wanted $4,000 for the customs to take it out. 
So we just left it there. Yeah, and that's that's the that's the difficulty that we started to face was the the state regulations that didn't take into account that we were nonprofit, didn't take into account that we were actually trying to help people in their community. We weren't trying to um, actually import things under the under the gun radar. Oh, I'll come over here in a second. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I just, uh, Two parts. One general has Hemel been able to return to Spain, and then number two, part of that very specifically, Catalonia, where uh, he was kicked out. Uh, we have not done any further work in Spain. We he did additional work in 1977 in Madrid, and then since since that work, I don't believe we've done any work in Spain at all. Uh, I would say just to tag on to that, we're attempting to get back into Spain right now. But that's true. We would. We would, yeah, I think Spain would be a good place for us. Much of Europe is very expensive and hard for us to work, but Spain is still a, a different place. And, you know, when you think, you know, Franco was alive for the first half of his time there, and they were going through a transition after Franco died, that's got to be the worst time to land in another country when you've had a repressive regime in place for three and a half decades, only, you know, and then have that vacuum of what's going to come next. No one's going to take a chance, I think, at that point. Yeah? So um, did those manuscripts um, get to those archives, you know, the ones that were probably not in terms of custom fees and such? Did they eventually? I think everyone eventually got their microfilm. Some of them were extremely unhappy uh, because they had to wait so long. But I know at least in one case, and I think this became the situation for the others, is that HMML finally gave in and said we would pay for it. Um, um, in terms of now, are there permissions set in place? You know, don't, like if you enter into an archive, are there release forms permissions? Is that, with ethnography and such, you know, we have to these kinds of things. So with archives, do you have those set in place as well? Well, we have, we have agreements with the libraries that uh, if someone wants a copy of it, we won't make copies without their permission. So they still own the contents of the films. But what their, their restrictions and what they decide over there is, is, is really under their law. And, uh, and so I don't know. It's different from library to library, archive to archive. Yeah? Um, your, your correspondence is one-sided. And so I'm oh, yes. wondering if you looked at what kind of information he was receiving from home. Was he getting yes, I did. or stop mining? Um, on numerous occasions, Julian Plant tells him, um, you, you may not quit, basically. <laughs> he doesn't say it in some way where he says, no, we need you there. We need someone who's from the monastery there, and you're the only one qualified to do it. And, and of course, a few months later, it comes up again. You know, it's, it's, it's like this cycle that they go through. They're kind of constantly dancing around each other, trying to, to find a way. And, and I think the part of the difficulty for Julian Plant was that this is in the same period that he's raising money to build the building that we're now in next door. So the Hill Library there was built at the same time that Urban was working in Spain. And so Julian Plant's um, attention is split out. The other thing is, uh, there's one incident in their relationship early on, which I don't need to elaborate on, but has to do with the purchase of a manuscript when Urban is still in Spain. And things didn't quite go the way Julian Plant wanted. And so there's a big tussle about that. OK, I can explain individually, but it's, it would just take your time if I did it now. But I think that kind of soured their relationship. Uh, so there's that. The other thing is, is that there's also a power shift going on within HMML, because um, the early power in HMML was really Oliver Kapsner. And if you look at the early reports from the library, Oliver Kapsner is referred to director. Julian Plant is referred to as the curator. About this time, Oliver Kapsner is retired. Now Julian Plant is the director. You look at the correspondence between Julian and Oliver. Dear Father Oliver. Dear Julian, okay, and it's almost like a, a avuncular relationship. You know, he's he's very kind of very helping him along. Between these two, dear Reverend Steiner, dear Mr. Plant, and they're still writing that way. You know, after years, 
Now, I know I, I am from a different generation, but I call my boss by his first name. I call the priests at my church by their first name. Uh, that, is, that level of formality, I think, is not accidental. I think there's a certain distance that they're maintaining. Yeah, Peggy. I'm never clear on that. That's part of the, well, it's not just Spanish, it's also Catalan, and that's tricky too. Um, I never have gotten the sense of whether he knew Spanish or not. What I find curious is that he'll send a copy of a letter back to Julian Plant that's written in Spanish, and he'll say, have Father so-and-so translate this for you. <laughs> Instead of, you know, I mean, because to me the natural thing would be is if I'm sending it to someone, I'm gonna translate it so that they get the original and the translation at the same time. Even if it's a language I'm not really familiar with, I'll do my best to, to get a, a, a somewhat accurate synopsis of it. Yeah? Was the attempt made to get authorization from the Ministry of Education, or at least to find an informal they, they did carry on discussions with people from the state. Um, the, the, as I said, the, the director of the state, uh, the National Library, was totally against it because he felt it was an American hegemony uh, issue. Uh, but that was true across the board. I think the, the, I don't remember if it was, I think the Ministry of Education was in there, I'd have to look again. But that was less through Urban than it was through Julian and through sometimes intermediaries like scholars, uh, Oscar, uh, Paul Oscar Christeller uh, or Paul Mavert, prominent medievalists who were in charge, you know, head of the medieval academy. These are people who presumably would get more um, respect uh, so those would be the kind of people who would go in and, and talk. And, and they tried to get into El Escorial and were rebuffed there as well. And if I can just tag on to uh, uh, what this kind of political aspect of it, you have to remember that the United States was a major supporter of Franco, and yet the people wanted Franco gone. And we had established military bases in Spain and you can just simply watch the film from the late 80s called Barcelona to give a sense of what the average local person thought of people from the United States at this time. It wasn't a very positive because they considered us to be major supporters of the regime, and we were. Um, and that would have, in a sense, I'm assuming that, that was my question, is was, you know, Father uh, or Urban, was he really kind of ever saying, look, I'm caught up into this drama of NATO and the drama of this emergence out of this dictatorship, and get, they're looking at me as an American, and I'm just... I, oh, I keep hoping that he would say something like that, idiot. but the, you know, the, the two times that I see him, well, he has other things, but they're more like the travel uh, tour, you know, oh, we had an early rainy season kind of thing, but uh, the only times that really that, so to speak, reality breaks through is when he talks about Franco being ill and people wondering when he's going to die, and then when Franco finally does die. Those are the only times that I've found in all the correspondence where that comes up. Was, you know, just to kind of give you a so it's, it's very otherworldly. <laughs> You're going, wait a minute. <laughs> it, it, I was talking, uh, talking right before, and I said, you know, still in the 1980s, late 80s, early 90s, I had to get formal written approval from the American embassy to go into archives in Spain to do research on this manuscript. At the view that at the Royal Academia de la Historia, and they wouldn't even let me in the door to show you. This was 1990, 91. Was Austria the third site that Oliver tried? Yes. He tried in Italy and had only partial success. Two libraries that said they would microfilm them for him. Uh, Monte Cassino that said no. Then he tried Switzerland, and there was kind of a general agreement that they wouldn't work with him in Switzerland even though certain individual libraries wanted to. Um, and then he went to Austria. And I think that's part of the analysis to think about was what was different about Austria from Spain. I've already pointed to a, what I think was very different about Spain from other countries. Austria, of course, had just, this is, he goes there in 1964, uh, and Austria had been occupied up until 1955. And 1965 is when, of course, the Sound of Music comes out. The Austrians are very eager to be citizens of the world. And so cooperating in an international project seems like a pretty good idea. Plus, they happen to be located between NATO and Warsaw Pact, both of which have nuclear weapons. 
and little Austria is sandwiched in there. So for them, just like today when we work in Lebanon and Syria with Christian communities there, those communities feel threatened. And I think to a great degree, although they don't say it in so many ways, I think the communities in, in Austria probably felt threatened. Uh, and not all of them came on board immediately. It took all, um, Oliver Kapsner a year and a half to get the Austrian National Library to agree. And that was only because the old, dic the old director who was there when the Nazis were in power retired, and the new director took over and looked at what they were doing and said, hey, this is a good deal. We get free microfilms. They're going to do 13,000 manuscripts in our collection. We don't have to pay for it. Hey, why not? Any other questions? It's okay. One more. Yeah. I was curious when you mentioned Monte Cassino. What yeah. percentage would you garner of abbeys, of 250, 63 abbeys in the world, of Benedictine, uh, have been open to being capitalized? Not a very large percentage. Uh, pretty much everything in Austria, of course, and three in Switzerland, and a handful in Spain that you saw on the list. Um, all the work that we're doing today is not in Benedictine areas. Um, and um, some Benedictine abbeys in Germany, but very few, and most of those were reconstituted collections. That is to say, uh, places that had been closed 200 years ago during the suppression of the abbeys and then opened up again later and they built a new collection was not their historical collection. And their historical collections would have been in the state archives. Yeah, they're now all in Munich, which is the, the best place to, you know, the best Benedictine library in the world is the state library in Munich. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Heinzelman for this fantastic discussion and thank you all for coming and beginning our year-long celebration of uh, the history of the world. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.